Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to our next lecture here in Computer Science 2120, which where we're further exploring Java and uh, software design principles. So today, I want to load into a project. Today, we're going to be talking about the solid design principles. So I know I've made reference to solid uh, pretty regularly, I think, over the course of the semester, but we haven't formally defined it. And just like I, I like to mention that 1583, that Java 1, the first Java class, it really is motivated by the concept of adhering to the drive principles, the principles by which you do not repeat yourself. A lot of what's going to motivate the second class is adhering to the solid principles. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to load into a project that has some source code files. And I really want to introduce the notions of solid. First of all, we'll take a look at what solid is. But then I want to motivate solid by showing bad examples and good examples. Uh, um, examples that, let's first load into our project, examples that violate the solid principles and examples that uh, that uh, don't, that examples that adhere to it. Okay, I'm gonna pause. What's happening with my readme file? So I have that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here's a project. Uh, so the first thing I want you to see is uh, this project is hosted on GitHub. Every GitHub repo or GitLab repo should have a README file. So when you start authoring your own, make sure you should have a README file. If your README file is in an extension of MD, then it will actually go ahead, which is short for markdown, it will actually display with some a, um, in a formatted sense. So later in the semester, I'm gonna show you that. Okay, let's start with talking about uh, the solid design principles though. So here we have a repository that contains examples and I'll share this repository with you or I'll share this, uh, this project with you uh, after, after this lecture. But this repository contains examples of the five solid principles of object-oriented programming. So the examples that we're gonna go over are written in Java and each example will have a good and a bad version to demonstrate adherence to and violation of the principles. So every time I've mentioned solid, just like dry is a uh, initialism, as a don't repeat yourself, so is, uh, so is solid. So here, the S in solid stands for the single responsibility principle. O in solid stands for the open closed principle. L stands for the Liskov substitution principle. I stands for the interface segregation principle. And D stands for the dependency inversion principle. And so all of these, the, these principles, I wanna say were initially uh, identified 20 years ago. <laughs> and so they, they, they're, they're so powerful in how effective they are in giving you a set of guides on how to develop strong object-oriented code that they're still relevant even today. So let's start with the first. So we're gonna start with them in order. Uh, the single responsibility principle. So what this principle states is that every class should have a single responsibility, just like what you've probably already covered that each method should have a single responsibility. So the same, just, just like you've probably learned that about methods and classes, classes themselves should also adhere to that. And so there should never be more than one reason for a class to change. So inside of the example here, let, let's set up what the example is. So the, oh, no, where did my, what happened? Uh, where did IntelliJ go? Hmm. 
Oh, Lord. Okay. Not quite sure what happened there. A small crash in my system. <laughs> uh, Interesting enough. Uh, okay, so it's okay. Nothing like a a crash, a system crash. Okay, give me a moment while I reset up. Don't really want to Let's close this. Yeah. Let us reopen our readme. Oh, now, okay. Okay, perfect. So, okay, so let's start back with uh, where we last left off. Can everyone still see my screen? Just out of curiosity. Okay, perfect. So in the example for the single responsibility principle, uh, we're gonna consider an example derived from say a tic-tac-toe game. So the bad example is gonna provide a generic board class that does board related things. It stores the values of spots on the board, returns the board's row, it prints the board out to the screen. So this approach probably is the way that you would have designed a board in uh, Java 1 or it's the way that mo many apps that you might encounter across languages or even in Java uh, might solve this problem. And on the surface, everything seems legitimately related to a real world board object. But the single responsibility principle is gonna tell us that this class is actually handling far too many responsibilities. So what I'm gonna do here is inside of this um, project, first of all, uh, we're going to take a look at the bad example and then talk about how it's how it's bad. But let me just finish the description here. So we're going to consider that the board class in the good example, the only thing it's responsible for is knowing the values of its spot and it's entirely unconcerned. So before we get into the good, let's just look at the bad. So here inside of this repository, inside of our source code file, you'll see we actually have two packages and we learned about packages last lecture. We have a main.java package and we have a test.java package. And so we actually have the ability to do Java testing, JUnit testing on any one of these. So as we read the source code, we can see how it's actually used in practice. That's one of the, one of the great things about uh, the JUnit testing. So let's get to the S to the bad, the single responsibility class and we'll take a look and so here we have a notional idea of having a tic-tac-toe board so we're going to have something called board and it's going to handle all the things that a board does so here i have my package right so this exists inside of source is the root directory and then main.java is going to be the uh, subdirectory, so the sub package, and then we're going to have a single responsibility bad package that this class is a member of. So every time we want a membership, we have to have a correspondence to the um, the directory structure as well as the package labeling. Perfect. We're going to import an array list. We're going to do a public class board. We have one instance variables that is spots. Spots, each individual spot is represented as a string. Spots is a collection of strings. So we use an array list. And one powerful thing about array list is it's modifiable, right? It can grow or shrink over time. And then we're gonna create our um, constructor here, board. And so there's no parameters that gets passed into our constructor here. We're going to initialize the value of spots with a new array list that can hold strings. And then we're gonna do a for loop for each i from zero to eight, right? We will increment and we will add the string value of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight to the various, to the eight spot, to the nine spots that are in the tic-tac-toe board. So we'll have an array list that says zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
I mean, I'm sorry, all the way up to eight, not nine. And then we have a, a method here that's going to return an array list of strings that will return the first row. So here it's just creating a new array list and then it's getting the values from our spots at index zero, one, two. It's adding that to the first row and it's returning that array list of three different elements, the three different values. And then for the second row, it's doing a similar logic, but the indexes are gonna be three, four, and five. And then for the third row, it's gonna do something similar, but the indexes are gonna be six, seven, and eight. And then we have a method here called display, where we will go ahead and we will um, go ahead and display the contents of our grid. So what we'll do is we're gonna do a formatted string where we're gonna index into each individual spot and just concatenate to a string using this kind of pipe symbol in between. And then we'll just display that to the terminal using system.out. Okay, so just as a quick examination into this, does everyone have a understanding about what's happening with this class? If you have any questions, go ahead and just put in the terminal. If not, let's actually test this class and see how it might actually be used. So here, looking at the JUnit test, we're probably seeing something we haven't seen before. So if we're gonna JUnit test anything that would typically be printed out to the terminal, so something that uses system.out, we wanna, instead of directing that to the uh, terminal to get displayed into system.out effectively, we wanna pipe that into our JUnit tester so it can actually evaluate the contents of what's being displayed, what's being uh, printed out, what's being put into the output stream. And so we can actually create our own output stream object that we can use for JUnit testing inside of this board test. And so that's what's happening here. We're gonna create a byte array output stream. We'll learn more about this later, about what a byte array output stream is, but uh, here's a good example of how we might just use one. And then we have our at test methods. So here we're gonna create a new board and we're gonna make sure that the board has nine spots. Here we'll create a new board and then we will create a row one, right? And give it the string zero, one, two. So we have our row one, and then we'll go ahead and then query our board for the first row and assert that those two are equal. Here, I'll do a test board return second row. On this tester, we're gonna create a uh, new board, and then we're gonna create row two, which would have the values three, four, and five inside of the array list. And then we're gonna see if the row two we've just created is equal to what we get back from our board, right? So we're just che checking the behavior from what we expect to what we're actually getting back. And then here we have test board returns third row. So I'm gonna create a new board and then I'm gonna create a mock row of what I expect to get back from the board for row three. Here inside row three on the array list, I'm just gonna add six, seven, and eight. And then we're gonna assert equals. We're gonna ensure that our mock board is gonna be similar is the same as the board that gets returned to us in terms of values. And so this is the reason why we had used this byte array output stream. Recall that our, our, our board class actually prints to the terminal using system.out, right? The system.out right here. And so to be able to actually test that, we're gonna create a new board and then we're gonna say, hey system, we wanna set the output instead of being to the default output system.out, we can actually invoke a method to give a different print stream. So here we're gonna create a new print stream and the new print stream is gonna be this, this uh, byte array output stream that we've created right here. And so this is to be able to capture into this custom stream what we would normally be displaying into system.out. And then when we do board.display, even though this is using the output stream, the default output stream, we've actually set that in Java so that we can now do this comparison. Now that's all that output is instead going into this out content uh, object. And so we can two string that 
and then compare that to a string literal to see if what's being displayed to the terminal is looks like this. So it'd be zero, one, two, and then a new line, and then three, four, five, then a new line, and then six, seven, eight. And again, when we look at the logic, we see, yeah, the new line is here, and the new line is here. Perfect. So we should expect that if all things are working well, I can click on this right here, this green arrow to run this test. I hit run test, and we can see that indeed all the tests pass them. So we do have something that works, but as we said before, it actually violates the single responsibility principle. And it's because it's doing too much. And it doesn't it might not appear to be doing too much, but let's see, let's see what a more appropriately um, implemented and well-designed version of this would look like. So I'm gonna close this, I'm gonna close this. And so let's actually open up our, not here, not in our test. Let's go here to the good version and we will see that we'll have a board but then we're going to also have a board presenter and a board shaper. And so when we're considering a redesign of this class to adhere to the solid principles, we have to consider that in this good example, the only thing that the board should be responsible for, here, let's go here. The only thing the board should be responsible for is the value of its spots. That's what a board should should do right like adherence to the single responsibility responsible the responsibility thing of a board is the value of its spots and then it's entirely unconcerned with how those spots are being manipulated per the rules of tic-tac-toe so whether they get manipulated as rows or columns or diagonals or displayed to the user such as whether it should be displayed in a console on the web on a graphic user interface or on your phone uh, so, so in order to support these additional behaviors, these additional roles, you have new classes, the board shaper and the board presenter classes, which are similarly hyper-focused on a very specific task. And so they are also past the attributes that they need. For example, board shaper objects are initialized with only a size because they don't need to know the whole board. So you're trying to minimize what each thing has. So let's re-examine the same board model, but designed with the single responsibility principle in mind. So going back here, again, we're gonna import, we're going to declare membership of this package, and then we're gonna import an array list. We're going to define a board class. And again, this is a great example of how powerful packages are. We have two classes of uh, two class names of board in the same project. However, because they're in different packages, they can coexist in the same source code uh, application. Here, our board will have a size and it will have a collection of spots that are represented as strings and that are held inside of an array list. Inside of my board, I will be given a size. The row will bind size to my size instance variable. And then I'm going to, for my spots, create a new array list of data type string to hold an instance of my spots. And then I'm going to iterate from i equals zero until my size, which is given to me in my parameter. And then I'm going to make rows that are three uh, values, three elements across. So I'm going to add the string starting at I. So this would be zero, right? Three times zero would be zero. Then three times I starting at where I is equal to zero would be zero plus one. So this would be zero, one, and then two. And then I would move on to suppose that uh, my value is nine. Uh, let's say my size is nine or three, let's say my, my size is three, then uh, then I would be one. So then that would become uh, three, four, five. And then when it's two, it would become then, um, uh, let's see, four, five, then six, seven, eight. 
So that'll give me my indices zero through eight. So it give me my nine element array if I want a board of size three. And let's see here, then I have one function. It's going to return an array list of strings. It's going to be called values at, and then it's going to expect an array list of indices. So the idea is given a set of indices, a collection of indices, a list of indices, we will create a new list of values. And then we'll iterate for each element, for each uh, index value in my indices list. I will grab the value at that spot of my board and I will append that to the set of values, the list of values that I'm going to return back to the client and then I give that to the client. So this is the refactored form of what a board should look like. All it does is it creates a board and then it goes ahead and, uh, and initializes it with its set of values and then it returns what values are at indices. And then all other responsibilities that this board might need to do is then modeled using a different class. So say for instance, we wanted to display the contents of the board. Well, we would use a board presenter for that. A whole different class to handle that responsibility. Here inside of board presenter, it would go ahead and take a reference. It would hold a reference to a board. Here inside the parameter list for board presenter, we will have a board passed into us and we will go ahead and bind this board to our instance variable. And again, the beautiful thing about these reference data types is we can have this same board reference across multiple different classes. So this is what's considered a composition. Uh, uh, um, this is using the compo uh, compos um, yeah, composition strategy here for being able to define the relationship between a board presenter and a board. So a board presenter has a reference to a board, right? We're not using inheritance. And so once this board's created, we could potentially have multiple other classes that has a reference to the same board. Now, board presenter has a one, one responsibility and it's to be able to display the board the way it's intended to be displayed for this application. So here, since it's gonna display on the console, we'll create a string that represent it, represents a formatted board. Then we'll do this for loop that's going to loop through all nine indices, right? So remember the board size is three, but for each row, there's three columns. So to create a for loop, we'll take the row size by the column size because our board, even though it's modeled as a two-dimensional object in the game of tic-tac-toe, internally, it's only represented as a, as a 1D array, right? As a, as a single array. So what we can do here is we will create a line and then we'll say, hey, if the current index or the current I value of my for loop, if I add one to that and mod it to the size, and if that's equal to zero, then I know it's time to do a new line character. Otherwise, I'm gonna use one of these pipe characters. And then I'll go ahead and get the spots for each individual item. I'll append that to my formatted board. And then I'll decide whether I need a border or a new line character and also append that to my formatted board. And when everything's said and done, I will then display that to the terminal. So this takes in a reference of a board and then it contains the logic for displaying in a board. Because if you think about it, a board shouldn't be responsible for how it displays. It should just be custom designed for hyper specialized towards managing the responsibilities of a board. And then this board presenter manages how it gets displayed. And then a board shaper, it then gets to decide, well, if the board's contents are in a like one dimensional list, if I just have a list of values, how should I shape it tab in a tabular sense? Like how many rows and columns should it be? And so instead of that being an internal consideration for board, I can instead have a different class called board shaper that will, given some size, decide how many rows I need or how many columns I need to display it. And since, since this doesn't actually need the value, since it's just determining 
what the rows are, then all it needs to know is the size. So here, if given a size, we will bind the value passed into our instance variable in our constructor. And then we have one array that's going to be the set of row indices. And so this is going to be a two dimensional array list. So if you haven't seen this notation before, recall that an array list, um, since it's an object itself, but it contains other references to other objects, right? A collection of objects, the data type of the collection it holds is inside of these angled brackets. Well, an array list can actually hold a, a collection of other array lists. So here we're going to say, ah, oh, this array list holds array lists, therefore making a two dimensional array list. And then this inner array list, will we'll have a specific type of data type, integer. So this is effectively a two-dimensional array list of integers, which makes sense. That's our row indices. So what we're going to do is on our outer array list, so our array list that holds array list, we'll call this row indices, and we'll create a new array list to hold inner array list of. And then for each uh, index for each i value starting at i until we get to the size, we will create a new row, which itself is an array list of integers, and make that a new array list. And then we'll populate that with the indices. So that would be 0, 1, 2, and then 3, 4, 5, and then 6, 7, 8. So, and then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and then return that row of indices. So that'll end up being three array lists. And each array list, the first one would hold the values of 0, 1, 2. The second one would be uh, 3, 4, 5. And the, the last one would be 5, 6. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 4, 5, 6. And then 6, 7, 8. And again, I'm reading this. But if at any time you're looking at this and you're like, well, how does this actually get used? Well, we can just go into our JUnit test and take a look. So let's open those up. So let's go to our board test here, and we can see at the at test method how we can test that the board has a size. So here we make a new board with size three, and then we'll assert equal. Is the board size, is it equal to three? And then for test board, spot count is square of sides. What we can do is we can create a new board of size three, and then we can go ahead and assert that if internally to my board, the spots, and if we go back to board, we see that we do have this instance variable of spots, uh, of size, I'm sorry, spots here. And for purposes of just testing everything, everything is public. So again, this is just for being able to express these concepts. Typically, I'd want my instance variables to be private, but that's why I can access them directly. But that's, that's, to keep things as simple as possible so we can explain the concepts. So here we have spots, this is an array list. So we just wanna ensure inside of our uh, test cases here in our testing plan that the size of the internal array list is nine if the size of the board is three. And it should indeed be that, uh, if it passes the test it will. Then on a board size of three, what we're going to do is we're going to test that the board returns values at the list of spots. So here on a board of size three, we're going to create an array list of values and we're going to add to it zero, four, and seven, right? So this is going to be the thing that we're going to have our expected values of. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a set of indices and we're going to set at our indices, the values of the index of zero, four, and seven. And on our board, we're going to invoke that method values at to get the array list of values returned. And we're going to give it that ar array list of indices. And then we're going to just assure that what we get back is the same as what this array list contains. So the string is 047. And if I want to test that, I can just go here and run my test. And I can see that all of my tests are successful here. And then for board presenter, I'm going to do the same thing I did before. Anytime I wanted to use JUnit to test against a system.out action, I need to redirect the, the, the default behavior of sending that to the output stream to creating my own custom byte array output stream where I have control over it inside of my JUnit tester. So I'm going to have an out content here. Then I'm going to create a test method called test board presenter 
prints board to console. So here we're going to print board to console. We're going to create a new board of size three. We're going to create a presenter presenter instance called presenter and we're going to pass it a reference of our, to our board then i'm going to set my systems output stream so i'm going to change the default to be this new print stream using the out content using this right here so we can capture what's about to get displayed and then i'm going to tell hey printer display the board so again, if I go here, that's that final action. It doesn't have a return type, right? It's a void on the return type, but what it does do is do system.out. So it's actually sending data into the output stream. So we're going to capture that. And then we're going to take our out content and we're going to two string it. And we're going to expect that that two string is going to be the same as the string literal here. And we can test to make sure that this works. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to tell it to run the board, the board presenter test. And in fact, we did go ahead and pass that test. And then lastly, we're going to do our board shaper test. So board shaper is going to determine the shape of a board given a size. So here we're going to send to uh, the constructor to new board shaper the size of two. And then we're going to go ahead and have our shaper here. And then we're going to create our expected set of values so we can compare to what the shaper is going to give us. So we're going to create an array list. Now, keep in mind, we're returning. If we go back to board shaper, what we're getting back here from this function call is going to be a array list of array list of integers, so a 2D array list. So we're going to create a 2D array list to test this out. That's going to be called row indices. So the outer array list will just be an array list. And then we're going to create two inner array lists because we want the boards, uh, the amount of rows to be two. So here we'll have row one and row two, which are themselves array lists. Inside of row one, we will add zero and one. And inside of row two, we will add two and three. And then inside of our, our two dimensional array list, we'll add the array list one. I mean, the row one, which is an array list, and then we'll do row two, which itself is an array, uh, an array list. So row indices is going to hold two array lists, where array list one has the values of zero and one, and where array list two has the values of two and three. And then we're going to go ahead and then on our shaper, we're going to invoke its method row indices, and we're going to get ensure that we're going to make sure that it actually equals what we have here. And again, if I go and test that, I should see that my tests go ahead and pass. Excellent. So with that evaluation of the JUnit test, we see that the behaviors that we have between board and these now three classes are the same, but now these three classes allow us to adhere to the single responsible responsibility principle. The, the core idea here is that our classes never do too much. And when they start doing too much, we start breaking them across different classes. And then since they all kind of represent a similar set of actions that happen across a board, we don't use inheritance for this breakup, we use composition. So we use, the, we use references to the base board to be able to then decide how we're going to present a board or how we're gonna be able to determine what the indices for a board is. So does anyone have any questions for the single responsibility principle? Or does this, or do, does the, the bad example versus the good example about how we would like to have it modeled, does this make sense? And so I invite anyone to go ahead and leave any kind of comment or question uh, in the terminal and, I mean, in, inside the chat room and, while I wait for you to do that, I'm going to start to sum up the O, the, the next thing in solid, which is going to be our open close principle. So the open close principle states that software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. So there's something called the design strategy, the design pattern, which we're going to see what that is. I mean, sorry, the strategy pattern. So we're going to look at 
the strategy pattern as the good example for this. So I guess let's look at the bad example first and foremost. Before we start talking about uh, the, the comments here, let's go to our bad example, open close. Okay, so for this, notice how in the bad example, anytime we want to add a new type of greeting, so we're gonna have something, we're gonna have a greeter class, we have to change the greeter class to accept the new type of personality. So let's take a look at this. So we have this public class greeter and a greeter has some type of uh, formality. So think of something like a Walmart greeter. So when this greeter goes to greet somebody, we look at the formality and we evaluate, hey, so if their formality is formal, we'll say, or we'll return back as a string, good evening, sir. Also, if, if the formality is casual, we might return back the string, sup, bro. Else if the formality is intimate, we might return back the string, hello, darling. And if it's not formal, casual, or intimate, our default string might just be hello. And then we have a setter method where inside of a greeter, we can set the formality of whatever the string is, and we will bind that to that reference. Okay, let's do a quick test just to see what this actually looks like in person. So I will go to the bad example of open close, and I'm gonna open this up here. So here I have my greeter test. I have a couple of different test methods. The first is to test says hello. So I'll create a new greeter, and then I'll just assert that the greeter's greet is hello. Then I'm going to do a different test. I want to test hello formally. So I'm going to create a new greeter. I'm going to set the formality to formal. And then I'm going to assert that when I have the greeter greet, it's going to say, good evening, sir. And then I'm going to test to see if my greeter says hello casually. So I'm going to create a new greeter. I'm going to set the formality to casual. And then I'm going to assert, assert equal that sup bro is going to be returned from my greeter's greet. And then finally, I'm going to set, I want to test uh, the hello that is intimate, the intimate hello. So test hello intimately. So I'm going to create a new greeter. And then I'm going to set the formality to intimate. And then when I have my greeter greet, I'm going to see if it gives me back hello darling. And then I'll do a quick test of this. So let me run this greeter test. And I can see I pass all of these. So that's my expected behaviors there. So. Going back here, let's see what this is in violation of. So this probably looks like something that we might have solved for a greeter, but this is in violation of that open close principle where we should be open for extension, but close for modification. So uh, the problem here is every time we want to introduce, or the problem that we're going to face with this implementation is every time we want to uh, add a new type of greeting, to our greeter, we'd actually have to update or refactor the greeter code. And that we don't want that, right? We want the greeter code to be written that one time. And then as we expand its functionality, we can, we can, we can open it up for additional extension, but we don't want to modify the code anymore. So we can use the strategy pattern to solve the problem that's given to us in the, uh, by following this open close principle. So again, notice how in this bad example, anytime we wanna add a new style of greeting, we have to change the greeter class to accept a new type of personality. We don't want to have to modify our existing code, uh, our existing working code to add something new. Instead, we're going to do what we're gonna, we're going to adhere to what happens in this good example, where instead we'll have a high level greeter class that's instantiated with a personality. And the personality is something we don't know yet, right? That's gonna be given to us, that's gonna be given to the greeter, just that it will be some object that implements the personality interface. Now we can add new objects like formal personality, casual personality, or intimate personality, and just make sure they correctly implement the personality interface. And so the personality interface is gonna have a greet method, an abstract greet method. And then the greeter class is now open for future extensions while remaining closed for modification where you don't have to keep 
re-implementing a method inside of it. So it's locked down. Okay, so I'm going to close the, the old version and let's go ahead and take a an gander at this newer one. So we're going to look at Greeter. So let's see how Greeter's changed. So we have Greeter. Now Greeter has a personality data type. And when we create a greeter, it requires a personality to get passed to it. And then we will bind the personality to the instance variable. And then our greeter will have a greet where it returns back as a string, the greet from its personality. So notice this is using composition as well. So a greeter has a personality. And so this greet is what's using what's called the adapter pattern. So, which means that our greeters greet will rely on the greet that is defined inside of personality. So personality itself has a greet method. So we're just going to, anytime client code has the greeter greet, the greeter will then rely on the personalities implementation of greed. And so uh, this is also called uh, the, the um, strategy pattern as well, because the behavior of greed for a particular greeter will then rely on whatever the personality is. So you can have multiple greeters that all are given different personality. So their, their greed, their, what gets returned from the greet method is going to change based off of what strategy that personality has. So the same method can produce a variety of responses or results. Let's actually see that in practice. Let's see what personality looks like. Because again, this is using, it's using the interface personality. So anything that is a member of personality is a valid, uh, is a valid um, uh, reference for this instance variable. So a personality is just an interface that can, uh, that will have a method of greet so let's look at the intimate personality, the formal personality and the casual personality. So on an intimate personality, it implements personality. So it's gonna implement this interface. And so that interface has the one method. So it's gonna define what that one method does. So it's going to return, hello, darling. Whereas formal personality is going to return, good evening, sir. Whereas casual personality is going to return, sup, bro. So again, the exact same implementation uh, not this exact same implement, this the exact same behavior from the bad example, but in this example, we can actually see how now we can create new personalities at any given time, and we never have to change the core implementation of Greeter. So this is open for extension, but it's closed for modification is what that means. And let's actually test this out. Let's make sure that this works the way we'd expect it to. So let's go here to our testers. So I'm going to go to our open closed and make sure that the implementation we're looking at is actually going to work in practice. So when I look at my greeter test here, the greeter test, since it relies on this strategy pattern, we don't want to test using these other things like casual personality to, uh, task or, or formal personality or, or intimate personality, because those might affect the actual testing of greeter. So in our test strategy here, in, the, in our testing plan for this, we're actually gonna have two classes defined in the single class file. So we mentioned how you could actually have multiple classes. When that happens, only one of the classes has to be given a accessor. So here the accessor of public will be given to our greeter test. And this other class will be used explicitly for our greeter class. So we're gonna create just this mock personality that implements personality that's going to have uh, the greet method just return foo. So we're doing this so that we can make sure we can create a greeter without having to rely on any of our other concrete implementations. So we're gonna create a mock personality just to test this out. So here we're going to create a new mock personality in our test, greet someone. And then we're going to give that mock personality to our greeter. And then we're going to say, hey, when the greeter greets, does it return back food? And we'll test that. And if that test that works out, then we know our greeter works the way we'd expect it to. So let's run that test. And yeah, we are able to greet someone. 
So now for our casual personality test, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new personality. And then we're just gonna test that personality to see if it returns back this string sub row. Let's test that out. Yep, that works fine. Let's do that for the formal personality test. And let's also do that for our intimate personality test. And all of those pass the test. Excellent. So we end up getting the exact same behavior as before, and it works as expected. So that's a great example of how we would refactor our code to adhere to the open close principle. Okay, let's move to the L, the Liskov substitution principle. Here, this uh, the, the concept behind this principle is that functions or methods that use uh, references to base classes must be able to use objects of derived classes without knowing it. So for the example of what we just did, and we'll look at another example, one specified to this, but just to give you an understanding comparing it to our greeter, uh, every time we had a method that let's say took a personality, you could have different types of personalities like intimate personality, or formal personality, and the method that relied on a personality shouldn't need to know whether that personality was specifically an intimate personality or whether it was a formal personality. It should, it should be able to use any type of personality and only know that it's a personality. So again, the key to understanding the Liskov substitution principle is thinking about processes that use subclasses rather than the subclasses themselves. So, Let's take a look at the bad example and then we'll continue with this description. So let's go here. And I'm going to go to this unit upgrader. And then we're going to take a look at uh, the apartment. And then we'll have a penthouse and a studio. So we have a unit upgrader class and the unit upgrader class has a method upgrade that takes in an apartment. So the apartment is the base class, right? If I look at apartment, it's an abstract class. So we can never instantiate an apartment directly. An apartment's likely going to require, it's going to be extended by either a penthouse suite or it's gonna be extended by a studio to actually be concrete classes. Okay, so we're gonna have an apartment that gets passed into this upgrade method, which in actuality will either be a penthouse suite or a studio. We will then tell that apartment, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna increment your square footage by 40. And then this is the violation of our, um, of the Lizkov substitution is because inside of here, we're gonna, we're going to get the class label and ensure that it's not of the studio class. So here we're, we're making sure it's a penthouse. And if it is, then we're also gonna increment the number of bedrooms to one, but only if it's not a studio. So this is the violation here. This is because now, even though we claim to only want the base case, we're actually making decisions on it on a subclass. And when you recognize this, you're like, no, I have to refactor this. Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening here. Inside of our apartment, we have square footage and a number of bedrooms. And so since this is an abstract class, we have at least one abstract method, which is set square footage. So in our penthouse, it extends apartment. The number of bedrooms is four. And the, uh, the abstract method, which is set square footage, we'll just set the square footage to square footage. And in studio, we will set the number of bedrooms to zero. And we will implement the abstract method set square footage, where the, the parameter is set to the uh, instance variable. Excellent. So let's go back here and get a well-defined explanation of why this is bad. So in the bad example here, the unit upgrader purports to accept any apartment in abstract class and upgrade it. However, once the unit upgrader starts upgrading the apartment using upgrade apartment method, it checks the specific class subtype of the apartment object to make sure it doesn't add a bedroom to a studio, which by definition has zero bedrooms. A studio object therefore cannot be substituted in for any apartment. 
So if you don't follow the LSP, external processes will either break, behave improperly, or need to know too much information. In this instance, it's not breaking and it's not doing erroneous behavior, but it needs, it's, it's using too much information, right? Because for something that claims to just need an apartment, now it needs to know a specific type. So it doesn't violate the idea of how an upgrade occurs. So let's see what a well-designed class following the list call, the list call substitution principle looks like. And again, if you have any questions as to what's happening in any of this, this code, and again, I guess before we do that, um, let's actually look at the actual tester. So we, so just to ensure everyone understands what's happening here. So uh, let me just do a, a penthouse suite test. And all I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a new penthouse. I'm gonna make sure that the number of bedrooms is four. I'm gonna create a new penthouse. And I'm gonna set the square footage to 1500. And I'm gonna make sure that it has that number of uh, square footage. So here I pass those tasks. So I know that that code works as I expect it to. And here I will test my studio where I wanna initialize the studio, make sure it has zero bedrooms. And then I'm gonna set the square footage to be 600. So here I'm gonna test that and all that worked. And again, notice how the J unit is, what it does is it tests the classes in a way that it would be used by client code without having to build a main method and some kind of proxy uh, uh, application. So let's see here, uh, I have a question. So in line five of the unit upgrader, are we adding 40 to the square footage? So let's go here to the unit upgrader in the bad example. So in line five, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. So inside of the apartment, the square footage is, is incrementing by 40. And we can do that because right now we're violating, we're violating the concept of setting our instance variables to private. So we're giving direct access to the values of our instance variables to apartment to other client code. But we're doing that so that we can illustrate these design patterns more readily. But yeah, that's exactly what's happening with the unit upgrader. Okay, perfect. And for, so we know that the studio is working and then just going to our unit upgrader test. Oh, let me go to the test for our unit upgrade. Here, we wanna to test to see that the increased uh, square footage of the penthouse occurs. So we're gonna create a new penthouse. We'll set the square units to 1500. We'll create a new unit upgrader. We'll tell the, uh, the upgrader to upgrade the penthouse. And now the new square footage of the penthouse is gonna be 1,540 when we look at the penthouse square footage. So we can actually, we can actually assert what you were just asking about inside of our JUnit tester. And then for, we're going to test our upgrader to add bedrooms to the apartment. So recall when we create a penthouse, we're going to create a unit upgrader. We're going to upgrade the penthouse. So the number of bedrooms in the penthouse will now be five. And the number of bedrooms should now be five because we upgraded it. And so we're going to do the same thing for our studio. We want to test the upgrader to increase the square footage of our studio. So we'll create a new studio. We'll set our studio to have a square footage of 550. We're gonna create a unit upgrader, we'll call upgrader, and then we'll have our upgrader upgrade our studio so that the new square footage should be 590. And then we wanna make sure that the studio does not get incremented into a bedroom because by definition, a studio has no bedrooms. So we'll create a new studio, we'll create a new unit upgrader, we'll have our unit upgrader upgrade our studio and the number of bedrooms should still be zero. And just to ensure that all of this works the way we expect it to, we'll run this through the JUnit tester and see if all of these expected behaviors occur. And yeah, they do. So we have a good strong. So I'm doing the JUnit testing, not only to familiarize yourself with JUnit testing, but to illustrate how it allows us to confirm our, our understanding about what's happening with the class based off of what gets fed into these methods and then what's going to get returned from them. And in practice, this is how you want to develop your own code. And if you want to use professional approaches, industry-based approaches of uh, code development practices. Okay, so now let's go here and let's close that. Let's actually look at the improved version. So here we will have a bedroom adder, a penthouse suite, and a studio. Now, 
for the purposes of correcting the issue, we don't have the upgrade. Um, we don't have our uh, unit upgrader, but we could have a unit upgrader, but it shouldn't upgrade bedrooms, right? It should just be, be upgrading the square footage because there's no, uh, there's no restriction on that. But the restriction that was caught, being caused earlier was trying to add a bedroom. And we had to know whether it was a studio or not, whether we were gonna do that. So looking at this new version, I'm going to go ahead and look at my bedroom matter. And here, it's only going to take a penthouse instance, right? Not an apartment instance, because the level of understanding we need to know about upgrading a, 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 a penthouse is, is only available to the penthouse suites and not to the studio apartments. So, <coughs> excuse me. So we're gonna use it at the level that we need to know. And so for the penthouse, we won't increment the number of bedrooms. And since this now requires a penthouse, we can't pass a studio reference into it. And then we have our penthouse and then we have our studio. And now if I want to also have a unit upgrader, I could still do that. That would be at the apartment level, but now the unit upgrader would only upgrade the square footage. And just to test the behavior of this, why don't we go into our list cost substitution and actually look at the testers. So here our studio tester is just gonna ensure that the number of bedrooms is zero on the new studio. And that if we set the square footage to 550, that it is at 550. So let's test that out. And we see that we do pass those tasks. Let's go to our penthouse tester. Here, we're going to make sure our new penthouse has four uh, bedrooms and that our, our new penthouse, if we set the square footage to be 1600, that it is indeed 1600. So let's go ahead and test that out. And we see that that does go ahead and pass those tasks. And then on our bedroom adder tester, let's see if we test add bedrooms to a penthouse, we're gonna create a new uh, penthouse. We're gonna create a new instance of bedroom adder that we'll call adder. And then we'll have our adder add a bedroom to the penthouse. And then we'll assert that the penthouse now has five bedrooms. And we'll go ahead and just test that. And we see that those behaviors are all consistent with what we'd expect. And so that's just an example of what our Liskov substitution principle is. So the next principle is going to be the interface segregation principle. So here, the concept behind the I in solid is that clients, and whenever I say clients, we could think of that as client code. Clients should not be forced to depend on interfaces that they do not use. Okay, so what does this mean in practice? First of all, let's look at the bad code and then start describing what is happening. So let's go to the interface segregation, bad. Here, let's open up our interface for bird. And then we're gonna create a concrete class of eagle and a concrete class of penguin. And so inside of bird here, which is an interface, bird has two different abstract functions. So clearly what we're trying to do here with bird is we're trying to capture those abstract methods that all birds do, which is fly and molt. And here inside of eagle, we're gonna implement bird, the interface with eagle. Here, a eagle has a location, a current location, which is represented as a string. And it has a, a number of feathers, which is represented as an integer value. Our constructor for eagle is gonna take in a off number of feathers and we'll just bind the number of feathers to eagle. And here for fly, we're gonna set the current location to in the air. And for molt, we're going to decrement the number of feathers by one. So we'll reduce that. And then for penguin, well, a penguin is gonna implement a bird. A penguin also has a current location. A penguin also has a number of feathers. Uh, when we instantiate the penguin constructor, we're, we require a number of feathers and we'll bind the number of feathers, uh, the initial feather count to the number of feathers, that instance variable. When the penguin molts, it will decrement its number of feathers by one. When the penguin flies, well, penguins don't fly. So here we're forced to implement this flies method inside of this bird interface because the bird interface has fly. So we don't have a definition of fly for penguin. A, ping, a penguin shouldn't be forced to implement this method of fly. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna throw 
a new unsupported operation ex exception to alert the client code or whoever's using Penguin, hey, I can't fly. That's an, un that's an unsupported operation by this class. But what penguins do do is they swim. So I'm gonna create a method called swim and I'm gonna set the current location to in the water. So you can kind of predict what the violation is based off of this implementation. You can see this is pretty consistent with how we might likely define our interface for bird, but it doesn't work for all birds. So again, in this interface aggregation principle, it's easy to get caught in the trap of naming interfaces or abstract classes after real working things. The problem with this approach is twofold. The collection of methods defined in the interface increase as one adds more and more functionality of the object to the code. So that's a violation of the single responsibility principle that we covered before. But not just that, uh, implementations of the interface start to require ex exceptions to the rules of the interface. So considering the VAT example here, it may seem reasonable to create a bird interface that outlines the basic features of birds. They can fly and they can shed their feathers. It works for plenty of birds like an eagle, but then we want, when we wanna add penguins to our code, the, the penguin is technically a bird, but if we set it to implement our bird interface, we have to throw an exception for the fly method. The penguin should not be forced to depend on an action it cannot perform. And just to ensure that everyone understands the behaviors, let's actually look at these, uh, these methods uh, at uh, use in practice. Let's actually do a penguin test and a uh, eagle test. And notice there's no bird test because you can't test a bird interface. There's, it, there's no implementation to it. You can only test things that have implementations. So here on our, on our eagle test, we're gonna test that it actually flies. So we're gonna create a new eagle with five feathers. We're gonna say, hey, eagle fly. And we're gonna ensure that the eagle's location is in the air. And then for, to test to ensure that it actually loses feathers, we're gonna create a new eagle. We're gonna tell it to molt and we're gonna see if the number of feathers is decreased by four when its initial count was five. We're gonna test that, we're gonna run it and we pass those behaviors. So it's just as we had expected. And then for a penguin test, we're going to here create an exception and an expected exception of none. So here, this is just gonna create an, an expected exception uh, instance so that we can test that an exception actually occurs. So for our penguin, we're gonna create a new penguin with five feathers. We're gonna tell it to molt and we're gonna make sure that its feather count decreases, but we wanna test that it can't actually fly. So we're gonna create a new penguin. And then we're going to uh, have our, our exception expect a unsupported operation exception. So now we're gonna uh, set that. So before we had expected expect, uh, the expected exception, oh, that's hard to say, to none. Now we're actually gonna set it to be an unsupported operation exception. And then we're gonna tell the penguin to fly. And so that exception should actually occur now. And so uh, that's how we're gonna assert that. So this is another way of testing that exceptions are triggered. We saw another way when we covered that. And then we're actually gonna to test to see that a uh, penguin can swim. So we're gonna create a penguin, we'll tell it to swim and we'll ensure that its current location is in the water. So again, just to show you that how we expect our classes and methods to work are actually verifiable using JUnit. So let me test this out. Let's run that. And yeah, we actually passed all those tests. So it's as we expect. So now let's look at the actual good implementation. So we see, the bad implementation that violates this interface aggregation principle. And this is one of the principles that should be guiding your API, right? This is why we're creating interfaces that are disjoint, that are like breakable and editable and, and, and things like that. Um, carryable, equipable. Let's go to our interface segregation uh, principle here for good and see, instead of having the one bird, we're gonna have one that is a flying creature interface that can fly and one that is a feathered creature interface that is molt and one that is a swimming creature interface, which is swim. So notice you start creating all these interfaces and then you design your concrete classes that start implementing all these interfaces 
that can have a variety of things so that you don't get into a situation where a concrete class is forced to implement something that shouldn't have to. So our eagle now implements a flying creature and feathered creature interfaces. It still has the current location and number of feathers. Its constructor still just takes the initial number of feathers, which it sets, right? The, the, the behavior is gonna remain the same between the good implementation and the bad implementation. When we tell it to fly, its current location is gonna be set to in the air. And when we tell it to molt, it's going to go ahead and have uh, decrement the number of feathers. And then for my penguin, we could see my penguin is going to implement a swimming creature and feathered creature. So it's going to have the ability to be a current location and it's going to have a number of feathers. And so we'll set the number of feathers to the number of feathers that get passed into the constructor. And here it's going to implement, it's going to have a swim method where it sets its current location to in the water and it's going to be able to molt. So now, this is a member of swimming creatures where this is a member of flying creatures as opposed to having bird be a member of things. So this is what a better designed version of that kind of hierarchical construct should be. So let, let's see how that would actually test out in practice so we can see what the behaviors look like. So let's go to our interface segregation test here where we test out equal and we test out our um, penguin. So on our eagle test, we will go ahead and test to see if it flies. So we're going to create a new eagle. We'll say, hey, eagle fly, and we're going to assert that its location is in the air. So that's pretty much the same kind of test we had before. And then for our test to see if it loses feathers, we're gonna create an eagle. We're gonna tell it to molt it and see if the number of feathers had decremented. Let's test to see if the behaviors are the same, but the implementation is different and it adheres more to our solid principles and that works fine. Now for penguin, we're gonna test to see that a penguin uh, loses its feathers, right? So we'll create a penguin, we'll have it molt and we'll see that the number of feathers has decremented. We wanna test that a penguin still can't fly. So we'll go ahead and have a new penguin. We'll say, hey, we're, we'll, we'll set up our expected expectation to be the unsupported operation exception, which is implicitly thrown when you try to call a method on a uh, instance that doesn't exist on, and then we'll tell the penguin to fly. So instead of us explicitly having to throw that, and because we're forced to implement a fly method here, when we tell a penguin to fly, it, it never had that defined. So that should still occur. And then to test that it can swim, we'll tell the penguin to swim and it should be in the water. So let's test that. And we should go ahead and pass all those tests. Excellent. So that's an example of the interface segregation principle. Oh, sorry. Are those the bad tests? Ah, thank you. Let's go to our good test. Which we're going to test to see here if it can fly and if it can lose its feathers. Let's test that. That works for eagle. And then we'll test to see if it swims. We'll test to see if it molts. Notice we won't test to see if it flies because of our design by contract. We don't, we shouldn't have to test things that are bad. And so that in fact passes the test. So it works as per our design by contract. Okay, so the last thing we should do is let's talk about our dependency inversion principle. So the dependency inversion principle states that high level modules should not depend on low level modules, that uh, both should depend on abstractions. So abstractions should not depend on details, details should depend on abstractions. So here, you, that, that, that concept is what's referred to as a dependency inversion principle. Uh, to really motivate this though, let's look at the bad example first. So let's go here to, our source code and see what's happening. So here we have something that's called an emailer. An emailer 
it has one uh, method. It returns back a string, and the method is called generate weather alert, where it's going to take in a weather condition, and then it's going to set a local variable alert to it is, and then whatever this uh, weather condition is, and then it's going to return back that alert. A phone is going to be of type class. It's going to have a method that's exactly the same, generate weather alert, where it takes in a string, which is the weather condition. It's going to create an alert that it is, and then concatenate the weather condition and return that alert. So these two are exactly the same, except for one is an email alert class, the other is a phone class. And then we have this weather tracker where it has the current condition, and then it has a phone, and it has an emailer, right? Of these of these concrete data types, so it has a composition. Here we're going to create a uh, constructor where we'll create a new phone and a new emailer, and then for our set current conditions, we're going to pass in a weather condition where we bind the condition, and then we're going to check if the weather condition is rainy. Then we're going to tell the phone to generate a weather alert with the weather description of rainy. Set that alert, and then print that out to the display. And then if the weather description is equal to sunny, we'll say, hey, emailer, generate our, uh, an alert for us, and then we'll display that. So depending on what the description is, it's going to be depending on whether we get the phone alert or an email or alert. So again, just to ensure that we understand the implementation of this, let's go to our testers here. Let's close that. Let's close that. Let's close that. So for our emailer, to test this, we'll just create a new emailer, and then we'll pass it the alert sunny, and we would get back it is sunny. We'll make, make sure that works as we expect. Yep. So for our phone, we're going to test. We'll make a new phone. We're going to have the phone generate a weather alert. We're going to pass it rainy. And then we're going to expect it is rainy. Let's make sure that works as per expected. Yep. So I'm going to, as these work, I'm going to close it out so I don't make that mistake again of leaving open old test, test uh, classes. And then we're going to test this weather tracker test. So here, since this relies on system.out as part of its functionality, I'm going to create a new byte array output stream so that I can capture the data that's getting um put into the 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 system that outstream so here i'm going to create a new weather tracker and i want to check to see that the current uh weather so here i'm going to set the con current condition to rainy so i'm just going to check the current conditions is actually rainy then i want to test the alert phone users is when rainy so here i'm going to do a new weather tracker then I'm going to set my, uh, the, for system, I'm going to set the output stream to be a new print stream using out content. And then I'm going to say, hey, tracker, set the current condition to rainy. And then I want to make sure that what got, got put into the system that out is it is rainy. And then I want to do the same thing for sunny. I want to make sure that what gets printed out is it is sunny. Okay. So now that we have an understanding of that behavior, let's go back and actually read through uh, the dependency inversion. So in the dependency inversion principle, it's concerned with reusability. The high level modules or interfaces in this instance, our high level interface, uh, oh, let me go to the bad, is going to be our weather tracker. And so our weather tracker uses the phone and the uh, emailer. Okay, so I have, have, let me go to weather tracker as well, and then I'll go close this. Okay, so with the dependency inversion principle is concerned about reusability. The high level modules or on interfaces of an application should only be describing the general flow of behavior. In some cases, this may be considered business logic. Meanwhile, the low level modules are written in such a way to apply their concrete details to the abstraction. This is what's called the adapter pattern. Uh, in the bad example, the weather tracker depends on the low level details of the different notification systems. So the phone, the emailer, these should be instead be depending on an abstraction themselves. And so that way our weather tracker depends on an abstraction and not the specific implementation details of the email or the phone. So the good example will introduce an abstraction called a notifier interface. 
So let's see what this good implementation looks like versus what we had done previously. Let's go into here. I will have my weather tracker and then I'll have a notifier which my weather tracker will then use and then my email client and my mobile device. So in my weather tracker, instead of having a phone and an emailer, notice what I'm gonna have is I'm still gonna have my current conditions. I'm gonna have the ability to set my current conditions. So here I will take in my string and I'm gonna set that to my current conditions. And then for notify, instead of having a phone and an emailer built into weather tracker, I will take in as a parameter, some notifier type. And then I will tell the notifier, I will have it invoke its alert weather conditions and pass it my current conditions for my weather tracker. So the, the weather tracker is only now having a current condition, and then it will tell the notifier to notify based off of this current condition. So what's a notifier? It's an interface that only has one abstract method. It's alert weather condition, and it takes in a string, which is a weather condition. So now looking at my email client, my email client implements that notifier. So it becomes a member of a notifier. And so it's abstract method that it's now going to implement is the alert weather condition where that takes in a string. And so it's going to then check, it's going to check inside of its implementation of alert weather condition. If the weather condition is sunny, then print out, it is sunny. And for mobile device, which is also going to implement notifier, it's going to, which has to uh, uh, implement the abstract method alert weather condition. It's going to check if the weather condition is rainy, the thing that got passed in. And if it is, it's going to print out, it is rainy. So just to ensure that these behaviors are consistent with what we'd expect it to be, based off of this newer implementation, let's go to our testers. So here, let me go to the testers for, and oh, here. So if I wanted to test out my email client, notice since that relies on system.out, I'm going to go ahead and create that byte array output stream. And so I'm gonna create a new email client I'm going to set uh, the output stream to be this new print stream out content so that when I tell, hey, uh, Gmail right here, which is my email client, alert weather condition of sunny, that my expected output in my output stream would be is sunny. And if I test that, that should work as per expected. Yep, and let's look at the other simple implementation here. So for mobile device tester, I'm gonna do the same strategy here of creating a byte array output stream. And then I'm gonna create a new mobile device. I'm gonna set the output stream of my system to be this new print stream that utilizes out content so I can actually yeah, evaluate it for my test. And then here for iPhone, which is my new mobile device, I'm going to invoke its alert weather condition I'm going to pass it the condition of rainy, and I want to make sure that the output stream then contains it is rainy. So I'm going to test that really quick to make sure that works. And so here I'm going to close these two, both those run the way I expect. So finally, to test wet, uh, weather tracker tests, I'm going to create a new class mock notifier that's going to implement notifier and it's going to implement the method alert weather conditions, and it's going to it's just gonna print out the term foo, regardless of what this is, because it's just designed to ensure we can operate on a notifier and we don't care about the actual implementation of a notifier. And so here, since the notifier is gonna to print to the system.out, we're gonna use the same strategy here. We're gonna define an out content byte stream. We're gonna create a new weather tracker. We're gonna set the condition to cloudy. We're gonna to check to make sure our current condition is cloudy. And then we're going to test the notifier using the notifier with the weather condition. So we'll use a new weather tracker. We're going to create a, uh, we're going to set the output to our system.out to use the, our out content as a print stream. And then we'll go, go ahead and set the conditions to cloudy. We'll create that new mock notifier. And then we will then tell our tracker to notify the mock notifier. And then we want to see if inside of our output stream, we have the string foo. And we will test to make sure that that works as per expected. So here I will run that and it, it does indeed work. And that's perfect. And so very quickly within one lecture, we formally defined all five principles that exist inside of Solid, And we gave examples of what are poor implementation, implementations, violations of the Solid principles. And we saw implementations that are good. And so 
one reason why I really wanted to go over this over this this lecture was so that you formally got to see examples, good and bad, so that as you're designing your own API, as you're designing your item API, your item system API, you can ensure that you're you're designing it with the solid principles in mind. Now you know what to look at to determine that and um, and that you adhere to it. Excellent. And as you progress throughout the rest of the semester, as you work on new programming assignments, just like on older assignments, you should have always been questioning, am I adhering to dry? And you start looking at times where you see repeated patterns in your code, where there's multiple statements doing the same thing, and you try to refactor that out. I want you to start doing the same thing with these solid principles. So like, look over them, get used to it. I'll go ahead and publish this project uh, the, into our uh, GitHub repo and so that you can go ahead and investigate it yourself, look at it and really kind of identify on your own what makes the bad patterns bad and what makes the good ones good in terms of how it's designed for reusability, flexibility and robustfulness. So with that said, is there any questions that anyone has about this? I know this is a lot of content. I know this might be a different approach on designing objects, but it's because now we're not just learning how to create like classes and objects. We're trying to learn how to use them effectively or like complex uh, uh, data systems, uh, software systems. Excellent. Well, will the code, all of this code will be put into the GitHub. Yeah. So, so you'll be able to open this in IntelliJ and actually be able to uh, run the um, all of the uh, the unit test on your own. And just if you're if, if you're curious, like, and you're wondering, well, how does it know what version of Java it uses? How does it know what unit tester it does? It's because of the configuration file. So here, this uses a pom dot XML file, and so I can go through and read this, and I can say, oh. The, the version of Java this is using is Java 8, 1.8. So that's Java 8. And the version of JUnit that it's using is 4.12. So this is using the older version of JUnit because this came out, this, this project was coded four years ago as a test sample. And uh, JUnit 5 is relatively new. But I can also look at the external libraries too. So if I click on libraries here, I should be able to see that my external libraries are I'm using Java uh, 18 here because I said it was okay when I launched this into my uh, my program. And then Maven had installed JUnit 4 in here, whereas we're using JUnit 5. And then it also is Hamcrest because JUnit 4 had an old dependency of Hamcrest. So you couldn't use JUnit 4 unless you also had Hamcrest. JUnit 5 removed that dependency. Even though that's neither here nor there, I just like to show you these little details about projects as. I see them so that you're, you get a little bit more comfortable on how to navigate this tool set. Excellent. Okay, well, with that said, uh, I'm a little bit over time. So I will go ahead and end today's lecture. And if you have any questions, please hit me up on Discord. <laughs>